Good evening and thank you for joining us for the Nursing and Your Professional Practice webinar. My name is Michaela and I'm the Practice Support and Practice Nurse Liaison Program Officer in Central and Eastern Sydney PHN. We also have Sarah Matten and Jan Sadler from the Practice Support Team assisting tonight. I would also like to welcome our guest speaker for this evening, Karen Booth. So I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work. I recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal colleagues who may be joining us tonight. I would also like to take a moment to mention that the team at Central and Eastern Sydney PHN stands in solidarity with all those affected by the recent tragedy in Bondi Junction and extends heartfelt condolences to the families and friends of the victims. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Please note that this session will be recorded and will be available on the CESPN YouTube channel within the next couple of days. At the end of the webinar, an evaluation survey will pop up on your screens and a follow-up email will be sent out tomorrow. We appreciate your feedback, so please complete this as this will also allow us to issue your certificates of attendance. Throughout the webinar, please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will hold the questions over until the end of the presentation and we will try to answer all of them, but if we do run out of time, then we will collate them and provide the answers to you along with a copy of the slides. I'd now like to introduce you to today's speaker, Karen Booth. Karen is the president of Australian Primary Healthcare Nurse Association, known as APNA, and Karen Booth has worked as an RN and manager in general practice since 1998. Her areas of expertise include prevention, immunisation, infection control, diabetes, chronic disease, care coordination, data management, accreditation. She also has set up systems in general practice, including nurse-led clinics supporting a team approach to care. Karen is skilled in health policy, workforce development, and advocating for the role of nurses in primary health care. Karen has over a decade's experience advising on national health reform and health workforce, including the MBS Review, National 10-Year Primary Health Care Plan, Strengthening Medicare Task Force, and the National Nursing Workforce Plan. Karen is a board director of the Australian Self-Care Alliance and a member of APNA, Australian College of Infection Prevention and Control, and also the Australian Institute of Company Directors. So I'd now like to hand over to you, Karen. Thank you. Cool. Very good. Okay. So tonight, our learning objectives for this evening, it's very timely today because we've had the release of the um, Issues 2 paper from the Scope of Practice uh, Review, the big national Scope of Practice Review, being conducted um, as part of the recommendations from the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through tonight's presentation. But I think the, the name of the review is Unleashing Your Potential. And I think that's a great name for, you know, to call a scope of practice review where they're looking at medicine, nursing, allied health, skills overlap and looking at, you know, the constraints that some professions have had on their ability to practice to the full extent of their skills and, um, and the impediment that that has been to actually um, doing really good primary health care in this country. So I think as far as... Um, as for us in particular, for nurses, it's a really exciting time. And uh, and I'm sure after I've been doing health reform for about the last 10 years, and I'm really sure uh, that something really, um, really good is going to happen, something very progressive. So, um, yeah, it'll be very interesting, uh, very interesting couple of months. So tonight we're going to talk about um, your professional role and what you need to meet practice requirements and grow your role. Um, the scope 
practice, our learning objectives, our sort of outline scope of practice for nurses working in primary health care, talk a little bit about how do I grow my practice and provide um, uh, uh, and get where do I get support to help grow that so through the PHNs, professional bodies, highlight the importance and um, of understanding your state legislation and the fact that each state to state is different. And then we'll talk a little bit about CPD, understanding requirements, and where can you source CPD? And I know for, um, for nurses in small businesses, like general practices in particular, it's sometimes hard to source um, support for CPD, particularly if you've come from the public hospital. My daughter um, works at RPA and she came home and said, oh, I've got Tuesday off because that's my study day. So I thought, I don't think I've ever ever had a paid study day. So um, we'll, we'll tell you where you can source CPD, including some free CPD. And then we'll also chat, chat about professional indemnity insurance. And I think there's quite a lot of confusion about whether you need to have your own policy or um, what does your employer cover? Uh, what are the, you know, why you actually need to have um, professional indemnity insurance? And then we'll just talk a little bit about um, uh, when we're looking at scope of practice, supervision, and the rules around supervision. So recently, um, APNA attended, uh, it was the 7th, 7th of February, we went to Parliament House and met with the Healthcare Minister and, uh, and launched the uh, National Primary Healthcare Nurses Day. So our aim will be to have a Primary Healthcare Nurses Day on the first Wednesday of every February. And part of the campaign that we have is making not just our colleagues aware, but other stakeholders, medical stakeholders, consumers, as well as politicians and funders, more aware of the skills that primary healthcare nurses have. We're science-based health professionals. And, um, and people always think about nurses as caring and nice and supportive, but actually behind all of that is critical analysis and a calculating scientific mind. So that's what we're trying to push to, um, to everyone around us, really. It was a really successful day and we had some amazing uh, media coverage from that and, uh, and a shout out from the Health Minister in question time, which was also um, very exciting. So primary healthcare is the cornerstone of our healthcare system. And most people think of um, hospitals when they think health, but primary healthcare is that first point of call. Um, people come, most people are diagnosed in primary healthcare. So they usually end up at a specialist or they're getting their investigations because they work um, uh, because they've come to see either a GP or a nurse practitioner um, in primary health care. And so we are the first point of call. We need to have a really broad skill set and, uh, you know, and an inquiring mind, which is, um, uh, you know, an interesting um, use of all of our skills. So cruising around on the um, on the internet, looking for things about scope of practice, and I thought, how do you? What sort of picture can we can I find for scope of practice? And I think this one in particular is just one of those mind map things. But I think it sort of says a lot for me in particular. So scope, there are words in there like potential. There's a plan, a strategy. There's a demand for nurses working to their school full scope of practice. In fact, all health professionals. And I think that, you know, there's a market for it. So potential employers will be looking at what sort of skills you have, um, how you build your portfolio to sell the skills that you have. And certainly... By being able to use all of our skill set, we've got, um, you know, the demand 
the consumer. In this picture, it says customer, but we're talking about consumers and health consumers. We hear a lot in the press about um, difficulty accessing care. It's hard to get GP appointments. Um, it's hard to get into, you know, follow up for hospital clinics. So how do we actually look at utilising all of our skills to be able to help patients access care? And of course, with any sort of model that you're looking at and our own scope, we need to talk about, you know, what are the risks involved and what, what are the benefits? So we're looking at um, quality and safety, improving care, being contemporary, and opportunities and future focus for the healthcare system. So I think, you know, as I said, this kind of pulls that all together with one click from the internet. So scope of practice, what is it? And when I was um, we're, as part of the Medicare task force and we're talking with the health minister chaired those meetings, scope of practice came up a lot. And what I put forward to the group was that it's really poorly understood. Um, you know, there's scope of practice around the big picture, there's individual scope of practice, and then there's overlap. We share skill sets with a lot of other um, professions. So, you know, how, um, what does scope of practice really mean? And so for nurses, the first thing you might need to know is apart from that, um, you're legislated. So we've got registration and endorsement. There's your educational background, um, builds your scope of practice, your clinical experience, any specialisations you have. And it talks about the full spectrum of roles, functions and responsibilities, um, activity and decision making. But I think the first thing that you really need to know that apart from those legislated things, there is no list of predefined tasks that nurses can and can't do, and um, which make, is going to make it very interesting as we move on and start to hopefully build a national capability framework. So there'll be a lot of, you know, how do you define particular roles for individuals and the groups. Um, the definition of scope of practice applies to registered nurses, enrolled nurses, nurse practitioners and midwives. And um, if, some, if, you, if you ever need or a nurse is being assessed by APRA, um, they would need to show evidence of uh, that they're working within this scope of practice. So things like your CPD portfolio, um, skills that you've learned so, so that you can actually refer back to that to show that you're um, show that you're competent. So there's the big picture. We've got professional scope of practice and um, things that affect that are the, our legislation. So the legislation looks at the entire profession. There are core registration standards. Then there are professional codes, um, codes of conduct and guidelines for, uh, for all of the, certainly all of the ARPA registered professionals. There are frameworks to help you guide decision-making. And that professional picture is much bigger than the um, and broader than that for the individual nurse. So your skills might not be the entire extent of the um, professional spectrum, and but the practice that you do, you're able to prove that you're competent in that. So. Scope of practice for the individual nurse is looking at, are you educated? Have you got evidence of your education? Um, are you competent? So have you developed your skills um, and skill set in, uh, in a particular area or for the things that you're doing um, every day? Do you feel confident? So 
you're competent and you're confident to do it and repeat those tasks again and then possibly teach others. And are you authorised? So making sure that that's covered off in the legislation that you're covered under, codes of conduct, and, of course, then workplace policies also um, come into play around what, you, what you're allowed to do in a particular individual um, workplace which kind of makes it a bit confusing when we're saying expand, expand your scope and then you might have a policy in workplace that constrains your scope. And that certainly has also been recognised in, um, in the scope of practice review. So to practise within your full scope of practice, you may require updating and increasing your knowledge, your skills and your competence. And... Um, the scope of practice review paper um, today, I read, it says individual scope is time sensitive and dynamic. It means it changes over time. Scope of practice for individual practitioners is influenced by settings in which they practice, the health needs of the people, their level of individual competence and confidence and policy requirements. So, you know, all of those things kind of uh, are, are the halo around what we what we can and can't do. So where do you begin? Um, and where you begin is not the end. So as I said, nursing is continuously evolving discipline. Every day there's a new procedure, a new skill, changes in technology, changes in, um, in the way we treat people. And the term scope of practice is looking at trying to um, look at the margins of that for both nursing the profession and for the individual nurse. And while foundational education for RNs, ENs, nurse practitioners and midwives at, um, at that graduate level um, covers a wide, um, the breadth of um, scope of practice, you then can build on that once you're post-grad. And um, a, a lot of the definition or the, a lot of the capability building that we do is around the population needs. So the population needs of um, Broken Hill might be different to the population health needs of people in central Sydney. So upskilling in areas that, uh, that are needed for healthcare for the people that we're looking after. So some of those defining things for us are competency and your ability to practice safely within your own scope of practice. It's not static. It's developmental. So we're actually moving all the time. And if you think back to where you were as a new grad and where you are now, you'd notice a huge shift in the amount of skills that you've, that you've learned. And again, specific knowledge and skills change over time. And, um, and it's important that you acknowledge any limitation of competence. So if you're not, if you don't feel that you're um, skilled in an area, what do you do with that? Do you say, no, I'm not going to do that activity or do you go to, to get training? And I think that determining competence, recognising your own abilities and practising within the limit of that, um, as I said, in your own qualifications, growing it as you need, but not beyond the legislative codes of conduct. So accountability, so being, being um, answerable for the decisions that you make for your own conduct, and that applies to both actions, so the things you do or the things you omit. So whether um, you might forget something or you uh, intentionally decide not to do something, um, you know, care for a particular patient. Um, those things can be counted as or looked at 
they're things you're still accountable for and responsibility. So they're things that um, you're responsible for. And delegation, delegation, um, we delegate all every day. You know, we, we might ask someone to do a task for us. In hospitals, you know, there's a whole series system of delegations. If you're in aged care, again, it's much more marked the, um, the system of delegation in those larger um, uh, health services. In general practice, um, it's not quite as clear. So um, you just need to make sure that the right task, the right circumstance, the right person that you've asked to do a particular task, um, directions or instructions and supervision. So if you're a registered nurse, you might ask an enrolled nurse to or delegate a task to the enrolled nurse around patient care. Um, if it's a... Um, if you're doing a recall list, you might delegate that recall list to a clerical staff member um, who I believe they should all do the recall lists. But you, you know that that is within that person's skill set to send out those reminder, um, those reminder um, notifications. And emergency situations, um, you have to act in the best interest of the patient. And um, I am on a couple of... Um, nurse um, Facebook pages. Um, we're looking at a professional type pages. But I, I see nurses posting, oh, they came in for wound care, but um, uh, the doctor wasn't available, so I sent them away. And I think, well, that's, um, you know, an, not probably not quite an emergency situation, but if that person was seeking care, you know, probably they shouldn't have been sent away. So nothing should be construed from preventing a nurse taking appropriate action in an emergency. So if um, if someone comes in and they're in a um, in a distressed state, uh, you don't ask them what their Medicare number is. You just you look at treating them. So nothing should um, prevent you from rendering assistance. So the scope of an individual um, practice, we've talked about competence and now we're looking at it's influenced by context, so where you work and, um, and who you work with. Population that you're working with, do they have specific needs? You know, have you got a high number of diabetics or um, have you, are you working near a coal mine? Do you have people with lung disease? You know, they're, they're different contexts. And all of those things we just talked about, competence, education, qualifications, and your um, level of experience. So it means what we do in our day-to-day -day work must fit within our own level of all of those things, education, competence, qualifications, and fall within the professional framework for our registration. And we need to look at, do we have protocols or policies covering particular activities in our practice and um, and your scope of practice and the things you do uh, will change from patient to patient. I, we, we have lots of nurses in um, primary health care who work in multiple workplaces so they might do general practice two or three days a week and then um, do aged care or work in a hospital another one or two days a week so the context of where you work will change the, um, the, type of, the type of work you do. And it will also vary from nurse to nurse, again, depending on each of those individual nurses' skill sets. Um, and it's important to understand assessing your own capabilities and looking at, well, actually, how do I expand my scope of practice? How can I perform that task? Um, can someone show me? Can someone train me? Or do I have to look at externally at some sort of additional training? So to help guide nurses with decision-making, the Nurse and Midwifery Board, the NMBA, 
have a decision-making framework. And I know that everyone here has probably read it front to back and each of the um, each of the links in the documents. But basically, it, it's there as a guide to help you with decision making. And particularly around if you're looking at scope of practice, delegation, um, and uh, supervision for people in different types of roles. The framework consists of um, two parts. And one is around the principles of decision making and a guide, and there's flowcharts in the documents to help you with that, and um, and to assist uh, in delegations and decisions. And the framework um, is intended to be used in conjunction with the other standards for practice. So, um, our you know practice your workplace policies, legislation relating to nurses and midwives. I have put links in the slides. So, um, and at the end of the pack will be a whole pile of links um, if, you, if you need to, if you'd like to look up the additional resources. So the decision-making framework is... Um, uh, the purpose of the framework is to, as I said before, look at um, decisions, uh, delegations, decisions, and um, uh, what well, doesn't actually define activities or procedures, but the idea of it is actually to look at how can we minimise uh, risky behaviours, provide assistance to uh, in individual nurses, and when I say risky behaviours, I don't mean necessarily intentional risky behaviours. It's guiding you around uh, doing a risk assessment um, in, your, in your own right as you kind of critically and, and analyse the type of activities you want to do. It's also, um, so not just providing assistance for individual nurses, and guidance for the profession, but also guidance for employers. So if you're in a situation where um, you're being asked to do something that you don't think um, uh, fits with uh, your roles or your capabilities, or is you, you feel is really outside um, what is normal expectations for a nurse, you can look at the decision-making framework and then maybe go through that with your employer to say, well, actually, I think I this is the limit to what I can do. Or you can alternatively look at that and say, actually, I can expand what I'm doing. So knowing boundaries, your roles and responsibilities, and, um, and also for helping you to reflect on what you're doing. And the most important thing is around um, consistent decision making. So do you have a process for making decisions um, that that you would use? Doesn't need to be written down on paper. Um, but you know, do you have a methodical way, um, particularly for large and complex tasks, that you can uh, justify how you how you go through a decision making process? So points to consider when um, expanding or optimising your scope is, is it the right task for me? Is it appropriate for my role? And, uh, you know, again, those things, parameters. And is the um, what you're being asked to do or the skill that, the, that you need to develop is it relevant for your population? Is it contemporary? And so we don't want you going back learning how to do uh, a particular procedure from 15 years ago when we know that technology and uh, how you do a particular thing has changed. So is it contemporary? Is it evidence-based? Um, so, you know, what's the research on it? Or um, is there a protocol for it? What kind of education do you need? And, you know, again, making sure that you're competent. Um, what do you have to do to become competent in a particular area? 
And if you're being asked again, if you're not quite sure, um, check with your professional indemnity insurer. Um, particularly, I'm, there are some things now that are not covered by um, professional indemnity insurance. And so there's, uh, or you need additional um, insurance for, and that's things like um, cosmetic injectables. There's a lot of um, nurses who are doing that now. And so you need to check your policy to make sure that you're covered um, uh, in, case of, in case of an incident. So there's no comeback on you. And if it's a skill that you're going to perform just time from every now and then, how do you make sure that you have you can have some sort of uh, continuity um, of uh, you know keep, keeping your practice up in a particular skill? And for some things, um, it may be worth making sure that is there a policy or a procedure in place which supports the um, the skill that you're doing? Are there and, and I would say are there policies and procedures in your practice that might need to be contemporised. They might need to be reviewed. And if you think you need a policy for something, then, um, then it's worth writing one. And again, on the, um, on the nurse um, social media that I'm on, people are sharing protocols all the time. So there's, uh, you know, your peers are a wealth of knowledge and they will have... Um, you know, some particular items that uh, that they might be able to share that you can then adapt to your practice. But again, just make sure they're um, evidence-based. And I think, you know, we've got the picture of the nurse up there. It is okay to say no. So if you don't feel comfortable or you don't feel particularly skilled in a particular activity, it's okay to say no. Um, I know it's all right for me to say on the screen when you're being pressured at work, but um, I think you need to think about uh, your personal and professional safety, that if you're not comfortable, um, you don't do it. And then you analyse, what do I need to do to learn that skill? And again, those things we talked about before, the decision-making around um, extending uh, your skill set, learning, competence, confidence. So who's who in the zoo? Um, everyone in a uniform. It's really hard to tell who's who. Um, and uh, But everyone has a particular role and, um, and we need to make sure that people are working within their guidelines. So skill sets do develop over time. And um, as I said, sometimes it's hard to tell who's the RN and who's the EN, and certainly for patients um, or sometimes who's the admin team. And if you're in hospital and everyone's in a navy blue uniform, that might have a band around the arm, you know. Um, the porters are often in scrubs. The doctors are in scrubs. Um, it's really hard, hard to tell. So making sure that people, um, one, you're identifiable, but... Um, that you, you not only you know your role, but the people around you know your role. And um, and look at, you know, the picture in the bottom left-hand corner are nurses from uh, one of our nurse-led clinics. And, you know, looking at what are the shared skills, um, what can be delegated, and what are the RN-only um, duties. And as I said, with in general practice, there's a lot of clouding, small teams who work very closely together. And, um, and nurses and the ENs have a really, um, particularly when they've been working a long time, a really well-developed skill set. And so, but knowing where, where the seal is on that. Um, and no matter how they look, um, there are set delegations, legal responsibility, and accountability for each team member. So national standards for practice. 
Um, there are national standards. So we've got registered nurse standards, the enrolled nurse standards, there are midwife standards um, for practice. I've just um, put up registered nurse and enrolled nurse for us tonight. Um, the standards are the core practice standards used for the nursing profession. And so all of those things we talked about before where we're looking at our roles, our capability, um, our uh, competence to perform particular activities. And so they're also used to measure, um, say, competencies for uh, entry for international graduates into the country. So whether they need to do additional training or additional prac before they can get their nurses registration here. And they're also used for judging uh, return to work registration. So if people have been off for, um, for more than five years or they haven't kept their clinical skills up over the three year, um, three year time period, then they will need to be assessed against the standards. And the other, um, the other reason the, or the other thing the standards are used for is assessing um, for disciplinary investigations. And the practice standards, our practice standards, um, codes of conduct, the decision-making framework, they're all interconnected. So you'll see threads of each one through different, different documents, but they do interconnect. Sometimes I think we uh, we have way too many documents um, governing what we do, but, um, you know, they're there. That's how we have to work. They're the rules we have to, that apply to us. And it's all about quality and safety, protection for the nurse and protection for the public. So the registered nurse standards, uh, um, there's seven of them. And uh, again, they've all been assessed at uh, bachelor degree levels. So I think that's AQF7. And, um, and they've had high level um, uh, assessment for critical analysis. <clears throat> so maintaining therapeutic relationships your capabilities comprehensively um, dis, uh, conducting assessments, developing a plan, quality and safety, evaluating outcomes. Again, all of those things, when you look at it, that's a scientific evidence-based critical analysis and review of the things that you do. For enrolled nurses, you're very lucky. There's 10 standards for you. And um, again, uh, the uh, diploma is at an AQF5 level. So AQF is the um, Australian quality framework for, uh, for higher education. And uh, again, all of those things, there's a lot that are similar to the registered nurse standards. But the most important thing is that the um, uh, enrolled nurse is works in collaboration with the registered nurse and uh, and there's a reporting pathway around uh, around supervision. Again, practicing within safety and quality guidelines and engaging in your own um, professional development. Currently, um, and we're two meetings in, the uh, review of the enrolled nurse standards is currently taking place. I think the RN standards are almost complete. The committee reviewing all of that. So probably by the end of the year, we'll see some, um, some uh, news about uh, updating of standards. The enrolled nurse standards are 2016, so it's been a while since they've been reviewed. And uh, I can't remember the registered nurse standards, but um, we'll hear, hear something before the end of the year about all of those. 
the most important thing for enrolled nurses, I think, is um, making sure we have clarity around delegation and supervision. And it is a legislative requirement that enrolled nurses work under direct or indirect supervision. And at all times, the enrolled nurse is responsible for their own actions and accountable for providing the delegated care. And again, I would say to the enrolled nurses, if you don't feel um, confident or, or feel that you're not competent in a particular area, it's okay to say, no, I can't do that. And then look at, well, actually, how do we upskill you to be able to conduct a particular activity? So supervision um, of enrolled nurses, and it, this exists as part of a um, of the national safety um, framework. And for RNs who are um, supervising uh, enrolled nurses, you need to provide some guidance and support to the enrolled nurses. You need to be confident um, that those enrolled nurses are able to produce to do that activity. And um, again, um, you know, ensuring that um, the EM can, uh, as part of the healthcare team, uh, demonstrates competence in person centered care. So, as I said, the enrolled nurse retains responsibility for, um, for and accountable for their care. In some practices, and certainly in aged care, the enrolled nurses will delegate to assistant nurses, and the same rules apply there, where the, um, if you're delegating a task to um, an assistant worker, a PCW, AIM, medical practice assistant, you need to make sure they actually um, are able and competent to do a particular task. I think probably we've covered off most of this. Um, and importantly, when you're delegating a task, you need to make sure that actually meeting the patient's needs. So it's no point asking someone to do a particular care activity if that's not going to meet the needs of the people that you're looking after. It's very, very important to have a clear reporting pathway and, um, and know when to hand over to an RN. And um, there needs to be a policy to cover delegation and that that policy is compliant with the national all of those things we talked about, the nursing standards and uh, the competency frameworks. Um, and I think, you know, again, particularly for the enrolled nurses, making sure, I would say make sure you've got your butt covered. So make sure that you've got those policies there um, to cover off. If you're an RN supervising the enrolled nurse, you need to be contactable and uh, so that if the, if the enrolled nurse needs um, support, they have another nurse that they can ask. And I know we get um, inquiries at AFNA quite often where they might be one RN supervising 20 enrolled nurses in, in a, a series of private medical clinics. And... The nurse needs to be contactable. I was working in um, uh, in general practice a couple of years ago now, and I took a call from a, an enrolled nurse in aged care facility, and uh, that was before mandated twenty four seven RN. And this poor nurse, lucky I knew the patient. The patient had had uh, had collapsed. But the day before, like literally two days before, had had advanced care plan and uh, done at the practice the family had been in. <clears throat> the poor nurse, she was distressed. She, she and the assistants put the patient to bed, um, gave her some oxygen, tried to call the RN who wasn't on site because there was one RN for a number of sites. And um, 
and she couldn't find the RN, so she called us. I didn't have a GP to send, but we were able to get the flying squad, the geriatric flying squad from our local hospital to go there. Um, they couldn't find the uh, copy of the advanced care directive, but because we had a copy, we were able to send it to them. And the lady was treated, the geriatrician came and saw, saw her at the home. But, you know, there's a risk that that RN could be found negligent for not being contactable. So you need to make sure it needs to be a proper supported relationship, a contracted relationship with that registered nurse. And I, I still hear um, practices that have enrolled nurses and say, oh, my friend up the road has a registered nurse. We can call her any time. It needs to be a contracted relationship. And the other issue is that if you're, um, if you're claiming um, payments or your practice is claiming payments from the government for having uh, for the nursing hours for the work incentive program, it has to be the enrolled nurse must have a contractual relationship with a registered nurse to be able to legally claim those payments. Sorry, that's my 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 hobby horse, high horse thing there. Um, so the picture, the lovely picture um, in here, in, in the thing, we were in Parliament House, I did a parliamentary breakfast a couple of weeks ago, fantastic event where we showcased scope of practice. And in the picture with me here on the left is um, Kaylee, who is an enrolled nurse from Coffs Harbour. Um, in the pink is uh, Kerry, from, who's a nurse practitioner from Signet. She runs, uh, she owns a medical practice. She runs an urgent uh, care after hours care centre. And the local GPs refer their patients to her, to her team. She works with a nurse, uh, another nurse practitioner um, and, uh, sorry, and paramedic. And they do the after hour call for the area. And the local GPs, when they know that they can't see people, refer them to the clinic. So that is a fantastic model. And both those girls got to present, um, present to a large group uh, in Parliament House. And um, Di in the orange is she just got her nurse practitioner qualifications, and uh, we uh, we all went in then to hear the legislation being read for the first time for removal of collaborative arrangements for nurse practitioners and endorsed midwives. So exciting times. Hayley, the enrolled nurse, uh, is from Coffs Harbour and she runs a heart health clinic. So Kay has extended her scope of practice by doing additional training in, um, in health checks and heart checks. Kaylee uh, runs the chronic disease register for her practice. She has ties with the Indigenous community, so she was able to build up health checks in that community coming into the practice. It's such a great model that the PHN is now getting her to coach, um, to coach other local clinics into how to set that up. She's really well supported by the registered nurse in the practice and the GP. And the PHN was so excited when she was coming to Canberra to do the, um, to do, to present their heart health clinic that they, they paid for her GP to come with her to be able to support her in the audience. So, you know, you can, um, uh, extend your skills quite significantly and uh, and the whole team built around that project driven by driven by the enrolled nurse. So um, as I said, it's a bit sometimes a bit great who, who does what in practices, but I think the main thing you've got this fantastic team model. So responsibilities for employers, they're not off the hook. They have to ensure that you've got enough resources to safely do your job, to make sure that there are um, policies uh, in place to support you in your work. The decision-making framework um, is based on uh, 
competence and provision of quality safe air. Um, the substitution of health workers for nurses or midwives must not occur when the skills of a nurse are needed. So you can't ask the MPA or um, an assistant to do a job that's like an IV injection that should be done by a registered nurse. So that <clears throat> there are some things where you cannot delegate that care. And, um, and under the law, nurses and midwives must not be pressured or compelled by an employer to engage in a practice that's in breach of any professional code or guideline. Um, and that is in the decision-making framework with a reference there, just in case you need it. So growing your role and expanding your scope, you know, is the activity, is it contemporary and within the scope for nursing? Is it covered in my legislation? Ensure educational preparation. You have authorization. You feel competent and qualified. And if you are learning a new skill, and um, then to to you know have it supervised by another competent health professional, and that might be the doctor in your practice te teaching you to do a particular activity. You can sign that off as um, CPD, sign off and keep it in your file that, that you've had that particular activity witnessed. You'll get a CPD certificate for attending tonight. So all of those um, are <clears throat> proof of attendance or proof of a particular skill set, um, keep them in your professional portfolio. For practices doing accreditation, they need to have um, uh, evidence that you've uh, been completing your CPD and evidence that you are competent in a particular skill set. And as I said, it doesn't need to be a fancy uh, university or paid for certificate if you've been checked off by uh, someone who's uh, more senior to you and competent in a particular activity. And as I said, that can be all part of your regular professional development. So unleashing the potential of our health workforce and the independent review of scope of practice. So Professor Mark Cormack used to be a um, very high level uh, assistant secretary in the Department of Health, now works for, I think, Canberra University. And he's been tasked with um, reviewing and seeking feedback across the country for the um, what does scope of practice mean? What are the skill sets that we're looking for or, or we have in, um, in uh, our health professionals? What are the impediments for them uh, working to full scope of practice? And we know, um, and APNA certainly has done surveys where, and we do one every year, workforce survey, and we know that 30% or a slightly over about 33% of nurses say they never use their full skill set. They never use their, um, you know, their full scope of practice. There's another um, about 10 or 20% say we never fully use it. And we know also from that survey that the one thing that will keep practitioners in or nurses in their, uh, in their role is professional satisfaction. And one of the pillars of the, the five pillars of health reform is actually professional satisfaction in your role, role enhancement. And uh, when those things aren't happening and we have a workforce shortage and we've, had, we've heard recent surveys from GPs and nurses that, you know, a huge percentage intend to uh, leave the workforce within the next five years. But we know if they're working to their full scope of practice and they're content, they're going to stay longer. Part of the argument for the review around uh, scope of practice, and we hear, um, you know, it's scope, it's scope creep. 
meaning that you're coming into an area that's mine. And I think we need to look at what scope and scope creep versus extending your skills and what are the shared set of skills. And that is the um, one of the aims of the review. And what we'll hopefully do is then look at how do we fund those shared skill sets? How do we then fund better, uh, better arrangements for multidisciplinary team care? And so that uh, the report, as I said, it's the second issues paper came out last night and there's commentary and you as individuals can comment on the paper on the link on the government website. APNA will put in a formal response to the, to the review. From my perspective at the moment, it, it's looking very positive. So um, yeah, very good. That's the timeline for the review. So they're looking at health professionals, they're looking at different areas of legislation, um, looking at a lot of the states, um, uh, you know, there, there's legislation that doesn't align. So things like Poisons Act, which means a nurse practitioner in one state can't um, do the same type of prescribing as in another state, or they'll change um, one health service or let nurses or nurse practitioners do one thing and a new health service and not another. So they're looking at, you know, how do we, why, why are the differences? And just um, nurse practitioners, there are about 2,500 of them, um, I think, at the moment. 500 nationally aren't working as nurse practitioners because their um, health service won't employ them as a nurse practitioner. So they're just kind of stuck. And they're sort of sitting at that RE role despite the fact that they have an advanced skill set. So looking at why is that happening and how do we fix that? I'll just have a sip of water. Our next exciting topic, and I know you've all been waiting for this, is professional indemnity insurance and why do you need it? And I think these two pictures say it all. Risk mitigation and um, protecting you and your person and like seriously protecting your personal assets, which could be at risk. So making sure that um, that you are covered uh, in some way in case of uh, of an incident where you have the potential to be sued. For all registered health practitioners, so all are for registered health practitioners, all sixteen health professions, this is the overarching rule for them. They must have professional indemnity insurance and they must have arrangements that comply with their relevant register registration standards. It has to be renewed every year and then and um, and declared uh, with your with your registration. <clears throat> so the NMBA, which is the nurses board um, sitting in APRA, has legislation where you must not practice um, in the profession unless you hold appropriate professional indemnity insurance. And those that law has been in for more than a decade, I think. Um, and arrangements um, are, are looking at addressing the risk um, posed by uninsured practitioners. If someone is injured and um, and end up with some sort of disability, how are you going to cover their costs if they sue you? And uh, I think so that's a really important thing. How do we make sure that there's enough um, funds to make sure that any ongoing care that um, an injured person who's been injured by a health professional, um, uh, you know, how, how do we ensure against that? So it is to protect you as nurses against and midwives against um, civil liability. So any loss um, occurring from a, a claim that's made as a result of a negligent act or you've made a mistake or you've 
omitted care in some way. Um, and so, again, really important um, just to make sure that the policy that you have, uh, whether it's a private policy or an employer policy is covering you. You have to declare um, when you renew your registration uh, that you have insurance and you have to ensure, and they're talking about the preceding, the preceding period of your registration. And that means that you have practice in accordance with, um, with, the, um, with our professional standards. If you're not covered by insurance, you must not practice. That's that's the law, that's the rule. Now you might be covered by your own um, insurance. I have an APNA insurance policy. And when I, I was at one level when I was in permanent employment, but I do um, contract work in corporate governance now. So I have my own, like I've always had my own policy, but I, I have a different level. Uh, a policy now because I'm an, um, an I, I, I basically own my own business, which is me. Um, you must be covered um, either in your own or third party arrangements. That covers all aspects of your practice. So everything you do, me tonight, um, talking to you, my insurance will cover me. Uh, when I do uh, work in general practice from time to time, still clinically, I'm covered there. Um, so making sure that that's it. We know we have nurses working in a couple in different workplaces, and uh, so making sure you you've got cover that covers you for both, covers you um, if you're volunteering, in case your organisation you volunteer for doesn't have um, cover um, proper insurance cover for volunteers. So whether you're private sector, government, non-government um, sector, you need to cover off insurance. And um, whether you're part-time, full-time, casual, um, you know, independent contractor, you must have insurance. Your insurance um, must cover civil liability cover. So if you injure someone, then um, you're covered in case they sue you. Um, it needs to be retroactive cover. So that means sometimes called runoff cover. So if you're if I finish work tomorrow, I need to make sure that my insurance policy covers me for um, for the previous seven years. And uh, we know it's like medical records, we have to keep them for seven years. So you need to make sure that um, because someone might discover, you know, that procedure from a year ago, has actually sort of slowly crept up and caused them, caused them an issue today where they might come uh, and, uh, and, and sue you or sue the practice. Needs to um, be reinstated. So as you move into your next year, you're, you are covered. And um, as I said, all locations that you work. Now, if you're covered by a third party policy, so whether it's your employer or whether it's your union, we know that AMF have a fairly strong policy, but um, there are not everyone's uh, an AMF member or, um, or they might be in a different union. But you need to check that whether it's, it's, whether it's an AFNA policy or uh, employer or the union that you are, that you are properly covered. And um, if the third party insurance doesn't meet the standard that's set by NMBA, you are not insured. So you need to make sure you might need to take out additional cover and you might be covered with, um, with a hospital employer but not covered with a private employer. So you need to make sure that you do have cover that goes across, across both areas. As I said, I have an APNA policy and, you know, sometimes it's the, it can be the lifeboat in the storm. And uh, we know that on the whole, nurses are really safe practitioners, but one, it's in our legislation that we have to make sure that we have cover. 
one of the things I, I feel confident about is that with my insurance, my individual policy by AFNA, the contract is with the insurer and me and that I own the policy. So if my employer has has um, insurance cover for me and all practices have to have, they have a, a practice policy cover for um, a public liability and uh, professional indemnity. Uh, but if they say, I didn't approve that activity, are uh, you covered? So I think you need to actually look at your practice should give you, uh, show you that you're covered. So you need to cite the policy and not many nurses ask for it, but you need to be sure if, uh, if APRANOX on your door and says, show me your insurance, you need to be able to show them and prove that you are covered, uh, whether it's your own policy or third party. And, um, and uh, don't be frightened to ask for more information about your insurance policy. The benefits of, um, and it's a quick plug for the AFNA insurance, it's cheap. And um, it covers you, my cover is um, $10 million, but you can get 10, and for, oh, in fact, I think I've got the $20 million one, which is 20 bucks more than the other one, um, which says it's, it, it lets you know that on the whole, nurses are low risk, but we just need to make sure we're covered. And it's tax deductible. So that, again, is a really important, um, you know, will help you with decision making. It's make sure you've got a policy that covers you all 24 seven. Our policy covers you everywhere except US and Canada. You get some free legal advice if you need it. So uh, there's a link there to have a look at, uh, at the page and maybe compare, look at, make sure that you've got a policy that includes some of the stuff or the stuff that Apple has. And on the home run, we've got continuing professional development. And um, so those things we talked about earlier about being educated and competent and building your scope of practice, your continuing professional development helps you do that. And I can remember the days, um, like it was only yesterday, when um, the compulsory CPD came in and there's a lot of complaints about it. But I can tell you, I worked with nurses that probably hadn't opened a book for 20 years when the CPD came in. It's made a huge difference, making sure that um, people are practising professionally, contemporary, they've got a better understanding of, um, of um, the needs of the population, changes in healthcare. It's really, uh, really important. We have mandated um, CPD requirements, and that's since 2016. And um, so registered nurses, 20 hours. If you're a nurse practitioner, oh, and enrolled nurses, 20 hours. If you're a nurse practitioner, you have to have another 10 hours on top of that relevant to um, the things you do or as a nurse practitioner, um, medication prescribing, uh, tests and diagnostic tests. The same for endorsed midwives um, that uh, they need additional, the 10 additional hours relating to their context of practice. And um, or if you're a registered nurse and midwife and then you, and you have uh, dual registrations and you, you pay, um, unfortunately pay for two lots of registrations as an RN midwife, but you also have to make sure you have the CPD that covers you off for both of those registrations. So if you're an RN midwife, you need to probably have the 40 hours of CPD to, if you're going to maintain the endorsement for both of those registrations. So what do you have to do? Um, you have to complete the hours that's mandated for your level of registration. Keep a record in and one that helps to build your professional portfolio. And um, Athena on our website, we actually have a career, um, a career sort of mapping tool that you can you can um, and you can record CPD on there as 
to help as kind of uh, a keeping place for your portfolio. But to have a portfolio, keep it together. You can use it as evidence when you want to, um, if you change employers, if you um, if you want to ask for a pay rise, you've got evidence of the skills that you've been building. So really, uh, really important. Um, they can, NMBA can uh, impose conditions on your registration if you are not, um, uh, if you, you don't do your CPD. They probably won't cancel your registration, but they can put um, restrictions on it until you've reached, you've reached your CPD target. So one of, one of the issues for uh, for most of us who are working um, in a private um, private area, private employment, small businesses, is you know how where do I access CPD, and um, how do I pay for it? So there are there's a lot of free CPD out there, which is great. AFNA, if you're an AFNA member, there's more than two hundred hours of um, free CPD. And there are other courses that um, you can do where you pay a small fee. Non-members can buy the APNA courses as well. They're not very expensive. And then you get a uh, you know, certificate of completion, their assessments the way through. And um, it's worth sort of having a motor around the website to see, see if there's anything, uh, things there that suit you. And... Uh, our, I'll, I'll tell you about our conference in a minute. Um, and then, of course, there's the Central Sydney um, Professional Development website, and that's a great website. They've got um, webinars um, on uh, for, you know, sessions like this. The Backview catalogue's quite extensive, so there's some really good um, things on there. There's resources on there, links to, um, links to other resources for you. And, of course, you have the wonderful... Um, CESFIN team, which can help you, uh, help guide you to uh, to where you need to go. And there's some links there for uh, for the practice support, infra general practice, the education events, and um, of course the AFNA hubs. Now keep an eye out for scholarships. The government has just uh, funded. Um, a $50 million nurse scholarship um, program that they've, they've just awarded a, a awarded the contract to uh, to a to an organization to supply those and there'll be um, some news around that there's funding um, and different scholarships for nurses to work as nurse practitioners uh, or to develop um, you know, studies in nurse practitioner. And then there are other, lots of other small scholarships around. The PHN sometimes has scholarships. During COVID, they were, um, had wonderful scholarships for nurses to upskill as um, accredited immunizers. So um, yeah, very, uh, keep, keep an eye out. And AFNA will publish it. If, even if you're not a member, you can subscribe to our newsletter. And when the scholarships come up, we publish them in the newsletter. So that's free. You can just you can you can do that. And one one last plug for APNA. Um, we have got um, coming up in July the Essential Health Summit. So this is 25th to 27th of July. We'll have the Festival of Nursing, which is the APNA conference, and um, that it, it, we have a fantastic program. Um, the party part is always really good too, so keep that in mind. Um, and we're combining that. We're having alongside in the same venue with the um, Australasian uh, College of Lifestyle Medicine, and they will be having their, um, their conference along with ours. We, we actually have quite a lot of overlap in membership, which is which is also good. They will have a fantastic lineup. And you can probably look on their website. I think their abstracts are closed. Their programs start to pop up um, very soon. And um, and alongside of that, 
uh, we are going to have a, a primary healthcare congress and um, Michael Kidd, we just um, said he's going to he'll open that for us. We're hoping, we're expecting the health minister to come to that. But that will be uh, a, a, like a, a giant roundtable session for multiple disciplines in primary health care. We've got some, um, some really incredible um, health leaders from multiple disciplines coming. And we're looking at um, formulating and looking at a policy position for moving into um, uh, multidisciplinary care. And uh, that that's going to be really, really exciting. So, um, yeah, watch that space. If you, um, uh, it's worth looking, hunting around for if there's any scholarship available, uh, money available to support you. Some employers will support you to go. So raise it with your employer. It's tax deductible for them. It's tax deductible for you. And the knowledge that you will bring back um, and the enthusiasm will be worth every penny they spend. And that's it. Thank you, ladies. That was great, Karen. Thank you so much. That was a lot of very informative information in there. Um, we do have some questions here for you. So one of the first ones that I've got is for those practices that do employ an enrolled nurse, and this question comes up quite a little bit, if the RN supervisor is not available either on leave or off sick, can a GP be that nurse supervisor? We know in reality that that's probably what happens, but um, the registration standards said they should have some other cover arrangement. So it's worth looking at, um, you know, whether you have some uh, sort of contractual arrangement with an RN in another practice that in case they need support, they can contact that RN. Great. Thank you. And a question here around private indemnity insurance in relation to APNAS cover, does that cover all areas of practice, including hospitals, plus public and private practices? Um, yes. So, and dare I say, it covers ear syringing. I know that it's, we get asked that all the time. There was a bit of a um, flurry of activity, I think, last year or the year before when the union said they weren't going to cover um, ear syringing. But we've checked with our insurers who say as long as you're competent and it's a, an activity that you would normally perform, that you're covered. The only thing they don't cover, they don't cover midwives doing deliveries and uh, because that's not part of our, our, um, our cover but they'll cover RN midwives when they're if they're working in private practice, but not the deli not delivering the babies. And the only other thing I think that's not covered is cos cosmetic injectables. And I think that you need to then look at do you need additional cover for that? Okay, great, thank you. Another question that's here is that we have um, a nurse that's asking, am I responsible for reception staff? So an example is, say if I'm away for the day and reception are dealing with a patient, for example, a patient arrives with a cut that's bleeding quite heavily, is that nurse responsible for training the reception staff in triage? Um, no. Not necessarily um, uh, accountable, but it would be good practice. And I would, I've would i worked as a manager in a number of practices, make sure that everyone in the practice should have first aid. I mean, it just, that, that's basic sense, where everyone should have CPR and most practices will do that. It's not mandated for um, the practice staff, but it's good practice that they do that. And, you know, if, if someone comes in bleeding, you have to deliver. You're going to do first aid for that person. Whether you've got first aid skills or not, you're going to try and wrap that cut up and get the doctor to come in. So I don't, they're not responsible for that, but it's good practice to make sure that if you've got reg, a regular senior person, definitely, um, you know, in reception, 
working then um you know they should should have some sort of first day it's good practice to teach them triage skills it's good practice and i think we've had we've We've, we've done the triage talk together um, to look at making sure that you've got a protocol that your um, that your your front desk staff can follow, and I think as part of accreditation, you're meant to have an emergency flowchart for them to um, for them to be able to follow. It needs to be easily accessible. That is, it needs to be on the front desk somewhere where they can mm -hmm. see it. Yeah. and uh, and then know who to contact but if you're not there you can't be responsible for that okay and we do have a triage chart that if practices are looking for they can contact us here at CESPAN um, or the practice support team if you'd like to get a copy of that also I've got another question here Karen in relation to indemnity insurance is there a difference in APNA's indemnity insurance and New South Wales NMA indemnity insurance the ama did you say new south wales nma oh um uh that's a good question um there, there are some slight differences in the policy and um my understanding is uh, our members get access to individual an individual allocated sum so you can have our insurance policy, whether you're 10 or $20 million cover, you can have three claims to those values in one year. But I think the, um, the ANMF policy used to be that it was a pool of funds. And if the 100 people made a claim, it was the same pool of funds. But I think in reality, it's probably, um, it's worth checking the fine print in both to see if they meet your needs. Okay, terrific. Thank you. And I've got a nurse that recently became an authorised nurse immuniser. What happens with that as far as APRA goes? Is there anything specific that they need now to do? Um, I, I would, would um, you're lucky we're not in person because I pull my soapbox out and stand on it <laughs> and say that we should have some sort of recognition on our registration or recorded in some way who those immunisers are. Mm. When the um, uh, COVID pandemic broke out, we did not have a record of how many nurse immunisers there were. And APRA, NMBA, was emailing people saying, oh, by the way, are you a nurse immuniser? And then so that we had a picture of the workforce. And um, and we still don't. And I raised, I've raised that with the health minister a number of times. Um, for your CPD, so um, and the other thing, so you still need to make sure you do some immunisation um, updates every year, and that uh, your uh, uh, CPR is up to date um, with your um, your level of experience. I would advise making sure that you've done. Um, the, um, it's a terrible, the allergy course where they um, where they talk about the uh, allergic reaction, the adrenaline shot. And I'm, I'm the just, anaphylaxis uh, training? That's the one. And uh, so I, I recommend that you have all of those up to date. And, uh, but the main, the main um, uh, uh, issue for, um, maintaining your uh, your currency for that is making sure you've done your CPD every year. That includes um, something about immunisation. And Central Sydney have immunisation updates, so that's even better. That's great. So for any additional skill that us as nurses might acquire over time, we should make sure that um, we undertake some education relating to that additional skill. Yes. Great. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our presentation for this evening. So I'd just like to thank you, Karen, for tonight's presentation. And thank you to everyone for attending and participating in tonight's webinar. And just a reminder to please complete the online survey that will pop up on your screen. And also please continue to have a look on our website for our future upcoming events.